Have you ever known someone, uh, thought that you knew them well enough that you truly understood what kind of person they were, and then you got blindsided by something and, and you found out that they were really quite different than what they had presented themselves as being. I won't ask for a show of hands, but if you've lived more than a few minutes, you have probably uh, had that type of thing uh, happen. In fact, you know, if you think about it, infants probably go through this. Those people were so nice to me. Why are they speaking so sternly now? What is up with that? Why did they whack me on my backside? What is up with that? I thought they were nice. They're not nice at all. Uh, but anyway, you see this kind of uh, storyline actually quite frequently in movies. You know, you'll see a movie where, let's say, the well-respected businessman with the reputation of uh, doing everything just right is actually revealed as someone who's defrauding investors or running a criminal enterprise. Uh, one of the shows that critics often consider to be one of, one of the best uh, dramas in TV history, Breaking Bad, was a story about a man who looked like a, a nice, mild-mannered high school chemistry teacher, and actually he was running a, <laughs> a, a criminal meth enterprise. And uh, so you see these kind of things play out uh, in movies. You know, in real life, in, in most of our experiences, it's usually not things that are quite that dramatic, but it might be something like finding out that a friend you really believed had your back actually has been gossiping about you, or maybe the coworker who was always nice to you, uh, you actually find out that they've been trying to undermine you uh, pretty regularly with the boss. People presented themselves as being one thing, but they were simply posing for your benefit. In reality, they were something very different than what they allowed you to see. They were, they were posers. And most of us have experienced that on some level. We've seen those kind of stories, again, on TV or in the movies. We go through life, and often we cannot tell the good guys from the bad guys. We think we can, but we are often uh, mistaken about that. Likewise, I think most of us usually think that it's pretty easy to identify those who truly have faith in Christ, but it's really not as easy as we imagine. In fact, Jesus told a parable about the challenge of identifying true believers from false believers. Uh, you may be familiar with it. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares, wheat representing those who truly belong to God and the tares representing those who look like they belong to God but they really don't. And the point of Jesus' parable is essentially that as long as the church exists, it will have both wheat and tares in it, and we're largely not going to be able to tell them apart. It's difficult to tell wheat and tares apart because they look really similar to each other. And I think we actually have a picture today to demonstrate this. So there we go. The wheat is on the left. The tear is on the right. That's not the best of the pictures that, we, um, that I've seen, but you can still imagine if there is a field of those, uh, that those are going to look very similar to each other. And, and so the point of Jesus' parable in Matthew 13 is because those with genuine faith and those who say they have faith but don't can look so much alike, most of us are not going to be able to discern the difference. So in life, we often live with this uncertainty about who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and even those who have real faith and those who only claim to have faith. And here's why we can't tell the difference. Because we can only base our assessments, our determinations on what we can see. More precisely, we can only base uh, our determinations on what others allow us to see. And, and so that's all we can go on, what others allow us to see. We don't have access to who people really are on the inside. And so as we continue in our series in Hebrews today, it's all about Jesus what we find is that while we can't always distinguish between the wheat and the tares, 
while we cannot always distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys, while we cannot always distinguish those with genuine faith from those who are simply posing, God can. We don't know, but God does know. He always knows at every single moment what is going on on the inside of every single person. God is never in doubt because he sees beyond what we show each other and he actually looks into and sees our hearts. So we're in chapter 4 today and uh, we're going to skip over verses 1 through 10. To this point I had been covering uh, every section of scripture within Hebrews. Today we're going to skip over 1 through 10 and begin with, with verse 11. But I do want to acknowledge that in verses 1 through 10, Uh, What the author of Hebrews does is he continues the theme from chapter 3. We saw last week how the children of Israel who gave in to unbelief and rebelled against God were not able to enter the promised land, which is referred to as the rest that God had promised his people. And so the author of Hebrews used that example to warn those he was writing to that if they turn away from Jesus they will face the same consequences as their ancestors and they will miss out on the rest that God has for them. For the first reader of Hebrews and for us today, it should strengthen our commitment, our determination to hold on to faith, to resist drift, to not turn away from faith when we realize that God has a future eternal rest that he has promised to all who hold on to him until the very end. And so uh, that, that's what's covered in verses 1 through 10, a theme that we've already looked at. And so now we're going to read verses 11 through 16. And what we're going to see is that God knows what the rest of us don't know because God can see what the rest of us cannot see. God knows what's on the inside of every single one of us. Today, I'm just going to read, and you uh, follow along with me and and concentrate on uh, really taking in what the Word says. Here's what we find. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Again, uh, same thing that we found in in chapter 3. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. I don't like that I didn't have you all read, so let's read verse 16 together. (laughs) Are we ready? Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That was better. All right. Can you say amen to the Word of God, anybody? All right. So we're to make every effort to resist the unbelief and unrebellion that marked the children of Israel after their deliverance from Egypt. And we find in these verses some very important things for us to consider. Let's look at those now. While a lot is hidden from us about who other people are, one of the clearest things we see in this passage is that nothing is hidden from God. And here's what that also means. While we may hide a lot about ourselves from other people, nothing about us is hidden from God. God knows who every single one of us really are on the inside. Whatever I don't know about you, whatever your spouse doesn't know about you, God knows. 
whatever you don't know about me. What, whatever um, you don't know about your spouse, God knows. Nothing is hidden from God. In the context of Hebrews and who the author was writing to, God knew whose faith was weakening. God knew who was considering turning away from faith in Christ and returning to the law and the Jewish tradition. He knew. They may not have told anyone else in in their uh, circle of believers. They, They may not have acknowledged it to anyone, but God knew. He did not just know those who had turned away. He knew those who were at risk of turning away. And he knew those who had already turned away in their heart, but they just hadn't let it be known yet. Nothing is hidden from God. We see it in the text. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before him. God is never surprised by anything because he always sees what's happening on the inside before it ever makes its way to being revealed on the outside. And we see in today's text how what's on the inside often gets exposed. And here's what we find out. God's word exposes who we really are. Verse 12 tells us this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I don't know how many of you have, uh, have done anything with a double-edged sword recently. But you have to be careful with a double-edged sword. You have to be careful with a double-edged knife, any double-edged cutting instrument. Any direction you go with the thing, something's going to get cut. There's no dull side that you can touch and nothing happen. Anything it touches, it cuts. And the point of what the author is saying is that God's word is like that. There's nothing dull to it. There's no dull side that you can, you you know, bump up against it and nothing happen. Anything God's Word touches is going to be impacted by the Word. It's going to be cut by the Word. Isaiah 55, 11 shares a similar idea to this when it says that God's Word will not return void. It will not return empty. It's always going to accomplish something every time the Word is spoken, every time the Word is read, every time the Word is heard, it is going to accomplish something. Sometimes it draws people closer to God. Sometimes the word draws or drives people further away from God. But it never returns empty. There's never just a, 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 like, just a neutral reaction to the word of God. It always causes something to happen. Sometimes it encourages. Sometimes it convicts. But it never returns void. It, it never just like does nothing. It always causes something to happen. And what our text tells us is that God's Word exposes who we really are. And you see this, uh, one one way you see this throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament uh, or in the New Testament, is through the parables of Jesus. If you're not familiar with this, Jesus told parables and, and some people got them and other people didn't. So some people understood the point he was making, and some people just thought, what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? And he spoke in parables purposely, because it revealed people's hearts. If people heard the parable that Jesus uh, shared, and they, and they understood it, they did so because those were people whose hearts were inclined toward God. But if they heard the parable and they rejected it, they did so because their hearts were not inclined toward God. And and so Jesus told the parables as a way of exposing whether people's hearts were inclined toward God or not inclined toward God. And it's a similar thing here in Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is alive, active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. This simply means that 
God's Word exposes what's on the inside of us. God's Word penetrates us. It slices, opens us up, if you will, and it finds us out. It finds out what's on the inside of us. N.T. Wright writes this, If you imagine that you can slide along in unbelief and slip by unnoticed into the rest that God has promised to his faithful people, God's word will find you out. It'll pierce through and disclose what's really going on. The secret thoughts, the plans and intentions you make that you make the real center of your life. God's word exposes who we are on the inside. Now, here's an interesting thing. God already knows our hearts. God always knows in every single moment what's going on on the inside of us. So who does the Word expose our hearts to? I would say that the Word exposes our hearts to each of us individually. That's who the Word exposes us to, is to ourselves. Remember, God knows our hearts better than we do. And so often we can be going along deluding ourselves about our condition, and then God's Word comes along, it penetrates us, and it shows us something about ourselves that we had missed, or something that we had been trying to convince ourselves that wasn't true. It shows us who we really are. It reveals to us attitudes and intentions we've had that displease God that we might not even have been all that aware of. And it is a merciful action of God when he exposes us like this. It's a merciful action that is meant to nudge us toward action, toward change, toward repentance, toward taking a tighter grip on faith, toward exerting the necessary energy not to drift from faith. God already knows our hearts. But as his word exposes what's on the inside, not only does it reveal what's true to us, but sometimes our reaction to the Word exposes to those who love us that not all is as it seemed. And someone starts to get the idea, look, why are you reacting to, say, for example, what you heard at church today? Why are you reacting to it that way? What's going on that's causing you to be, be upset? What's going on that's causing you to be troubled? And so sometimes it it reveals to those who love us that not all is as it seemed on not all is on the inside as it seemed on the outside. And this is also a merciful action on God's part to allow those who love us to come along beside of us and to challenge us and to in love encourage us to stop drifting, encourage us to take a tighter grip on faith, encourage us to refuse the temptation to turn away, encourage us to grip tight for the first time, or to tighten our grip on the truth of the gospel. Nothing is hidden from God's sight. God knows who we are on the inside. His word exposes who we really are. And now verse 13 again, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God knows we are accountable to God and we will give an account for who we really are, not who we posed as being. We'll give an account for what's on the inside, not for what we allowed others to see. It's a sobering text. It's a sobering verse. Everyone will sooner or later give an account of themselves. In that day, if not before, all will be revealed. This is a warning against unbelief. It's a warning against drifting. It's a warning against turning away from the truth of the gospel. But beyond being a warning, there is an invitation here. And here's the invitation. If everything is ultimately going to be revealed, why don't we just get on with it right now? 
why don't we just get on with it? Instead of waiting for all to be exposed and all to be revealed, why don't we just willingly lay ourselves before God, open ourselves up and say, God, examine me. God, reveal what's on the inside of me. Don't allow me to wait until the day I have to give an account of myself for all to be exposed. Expose to me what I need to see right here and right now. Why not use this warning as an opportunity to get really honest about the condition of our souls right now? N.T. Wright again. If you open yourself day by day, week by week to the message of Scripture, its grand sweep and its small details, and allow the faithful preaching of Jesus and his achievement to enter your consciousness and soak down into your imagination and heart, then the admittedly uncomfortable work of God's Word will be happening on a regular basis, show you who you really are, what's going on deep inside. We should open ourselves up to this, not wait until the day that we have to give an account. Remember that God already knows everything about us. We will eventually give an account to God, but today his word exposes what God knows about us to us to graciously give us the opportunity to respond to not stay as we are, to make changes, to tighten our grip, to recommit, to resist drift, to realize that we're walking in rebellion and, and say, no, I'm not going to be rebellious toward God anymore. When God's word mercifully and graciously exposes what's on the inside, and in the times when what is exposed is sinfulness and unbelief and rebellion. We have to remember that the God who knows what's on the inside is the God who wants to help us with what he knows about us. He wants to help us. He knows and he's here to help. What verses 14 through 16 reveal to us is this. When God's word exposes us, Jesus wants to help us. When God's word exposes us, Jesus wants to help us. Let me read those verses again. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And then I want to add a verse from uh, chapter 5, verse 2. This is a wonderful verse. This is one that would go good on the refrigerator. Here's what it says. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. I guess it's a Partially a good fridge uh, verse, partially not. He'll deal gently with the ignorant. So, you know, uh, if you want that on your fridge. Okay. When the Word of God exposes what's on the inside that we didn't want others to see, or maybe we're even trying to avoid seeing ourselves, we have to remember that Jesus wants to help us. He doesn't expose it because he's mad at us. He exposes it because he wants to help us. Instead of being mad at us, what the word tells us is that Jesus empathizes with us. He understands. He understands. We don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness. He was tempted in every way, just as we are. The only difference between him and us is he, he didn't sin. He didn't give in to it. But he faced every single temptation that we face. And sometimes we don't really even want to deal with the implications of that. But Jesus literally was tempted in every way we are. That means he was tempted to disobey God. That means he was tempted by sexual sin. 
That means he was tempted by unbelief. There's no temptation you face in life that Jesus does not understand. And while he can and will and does empower us to resist temptation, when we fail to resist, he does not abandon us. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't turn away from us. He empathizes with us. And he does what chapter 5 verse 2 told us. He deals gently with us. He deals gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. Are you thankful that God is able to deal gently? That he's willing to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray? Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, let's just be honest here. Going astray from Jesus turning away from God, drifting from the gospel, when we really have come to understand the goodness of God, when we've come to see the beauty of the gospel, and then we drift or turn away from it, well, let's just say that's not exactly speaking really well of us. The word ignorant is appropriate. It's not speaking very well of us when we do that. But because Jesus was tempted in all the ways we are, he understands it. He he knows both that there is nothing that should lead us to drift away from the gospel. He, he, He knows that like we don't have a good excuse for drifting, but he also understands that we are vulnerable to being led away by things that should not lead us away. He understands that. He lived it. And because he understands us, he is able to deal gently with us. And by the way, we are supposed to emulate Christ in this very thing. We are to deal gently with each other when we do wrong. We're to deal gently with each other when we find one another in sin. Galatians 6 tells us that when we find a brother overtaken in sin, it is those who are spiritual who will restore the person gently, gently. God does this for us, Christ does this for us, and we're supposed to emulate Christ in this way. We're supposed to do this uh, in the lives of each other. And so if the double-edged sword of the Word of God has exposed sin, has exposed unbelief in your heart, that's not a good thing. It is a big deal. But you need to know that God wants to deal with you gently, That's his posture toward you. He's not raging against you. He he wants to deal with you gently. When the word of God has exposed what was hidden in us, we need to know that Jesus empathizes with us. We need to know that Jesus will deal gently with us. And we need to remember that Jesus is our high priest who is at this moment at the right hand of God the Father. Verse 14, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Understand this, Jesus has ascended to heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is who he has always been. He is truly and fully God. But Jesus is also at this very moment in heaven at the right hand of God, truly and fully human. He is now representing us before the throne of God, our human representative. He is interceding for us with the Father. He is our great high priest who represents humankind before the Father. And finally, when the Word of God exposes sin or unbelief, here's what verse verse 16 tells us. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of of need. When the double-edged sword of the Word of God exposes sin and unbelief in our hearts, it is not to condemn us. It is to help us. It is to mercifully lead us back to Jesus. It is to mercifully lead us back to God. 
It is to get us to turn away from unbelief and to believe again. It is get a, it's to get us to turn away from sin and to walk back toward Jesus again. I've known people who were very aware that their hearts weren't where they were supposed to be. And often I have seen that result in people pulling further away from God and pulling further away from the church. But when God reveals to us that we're not who we should be, his intention is not to drive us further. Although, it, it, if that's our heart, if our hearts are hardened, that, you know, it's all the word, not returning void. But God's intention is not to drive us away. He, he wants to get us to turn back. It's a loving and gracious attempt to get us to turn back to him. And so when the word exposes us, we have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. God has opened me up. God has shown me, maybe he's shown someone I love, that all is not as I've tried to pass it off as. My heart is not where it's really supposed to be. I'm struggling with sin or I'm struggling with unbelief. What happens when God exposes us that way? We have a decision. Do we... Do we turn back to God? Do we run to Him? Or do we turn away and run further from Him? Verse 16 gives us the answer as to what we should do. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. With confidence. Because of Jesus... Because of his sinless life, his substitutionary death, his resurrection that proves he fully paid the debt of our sins, because of all of that, because he's currently at the right hand of God representing us as our human representative interceding for us, because of that, because of all of that, when the word of God exposes sin or unbelief, what God wants us to do is to come to him, to approach him. He wants us to bring our baggage, our unbelief, and our sin to Him. I mean, His throne is called the throne of grace. He doesn't reveal our sin and our unbelief to drive us further away. He reveals our sin and unbelief to draw us back. And because we know this, we're supposed to be able to approach his throne of grace with confidence. And at the throne of grace, he's going to forgive us of our sins. He'll he'll forgive us of our unbelief. He'll help us to believe again. He'll help us to turn away from sin again. He'll help us to regain our grip on the gospel. I believe there are people here today who are like the folks Hebrews was written to. You're facing the temptation to walk away from Christ. You're facing the temptation to walk away from faith. Your confidence in the gospel is low. Maybe you're drifting away. Maybe just inattention is the problem with you. Or maybe there are some of you who are actually contemplating turning away, making a deliberate decision to turn away, you're at risk. You're at risk. I believe that God brought us to this study in Hebrews at this point in your life because he wanted to deal right now with this reality of your life. He wanted his word right here and right now, to highlight for you that you are in the same situation that many of those who first read Hebrews were in. He's drawing attention to your situation. He's revealing and exposing the sin and unbelief in your heart that is likely hidden even from those who are the closest to you. You might look like the most faithful Christian there is. But God knows. And he's reminding you he knows. And he's exposing to you what's true about yourself. 
that even though you look like that, you're not that, you're at risk. And he's doing this to graciously try to lead you back to himself. And so if that applies to anyone today, and, you know, I, I, I don't know by direct knowledge that it does, but in a room of people of any size, it applies to somebody here today. It probably applies to several people here today. And if this applies to you, here is the appeal of Hebrews 4, and it is my appeal to you today as well. When the Word of God exposes what is true about you, Hebrews appeals, I appeal, don't run away from Jesus, but instead run to Jesus and do so with confidence. That's why he's exposed what's on the inside. He wants you to run to him, and so you can do it with confidence. He's got grace for you. He's going to help you take a tighter grip on faith. He's going to help you believe again. He's going to empower you by His Spirit to resist temptation again. He's got grace. He's going to forgive you. And He's got the power to help you. To not stay in the condition you're in, but to change become who he intends for you to be. Let's stand. 